you're serious about your goals, and the RP Diet app is here to help. It creates a diet for your specific needs, lets you choose your favorite foods, and tells you exactly how much of them to eat and when. Expert System AI guides you along to keep you on track to your goals. For less than $15 a month, you have one of the most powerful diet coaches in your pocket. Cutting edge data science, tailored to your exact goals. The future is here today. Uh. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that is classic. Uh, I was trying to, yeah, too late. Oh, well. All right. Sorry about that, folks. That was a great opener. Welcome back uh, to the weekly webinar. Thanks for being patient with us this week. We were a little off schedule because Mike and Mel and a whole bunch of the RP crew was at the uh, Squats Connect Festival in Goa, India, which turned out to be pretty cool. And I'm sure Mike will have tons to say about that at some point, but we're glad to have him back. Thank you so much. Glad to be back and ready to roll. Um, let me bring up all the YouTube stuff really quick. All right, cool. So ready? Ready. RP Plus questions first, as always. And folks, if you really want your questions answered 100%, then feel free to join RP Plus. All right. Um, Liam Browning says, hey, docs, I'm less than two weeks out from powerlifting meet and my joints are destroyed from low bar squatting and from benching four times a week. Oof, been there. Oof. After my meet, I plan to work into a hypertrophy phase, but I'm not entirely sure if my joints would be ready for a high volume meso in the five to 10 rep range. Mm. Would you guys suggest I train at MV for a few weeks and chill out, or should I get back into training hard and high rep ranges working back into high intensities over time? I have two recommendations. Recommendation number one, take an active rest phase, probably lasts two weeks. Power lifters get real beat up and need long active rest phases. Right after your meet is over, for two weeks, train like you barely mean it, like a broken bodybuilder. Some tricep extensions, a couple of air squats, and go have fun and eat food and relax and don't think about lifting much. Train two to three times a week total. 15 to 20 minutes at a time. In one of those weeks, you could just not train at all. Give yourself a real big break. Second one is when you go into your training uh, after that uh, in the five to 10 rep range is great. Do not low bar squat and do not conventional bench. Pick other exercises which do not remotely look like them. High bar squat's a good idea. Um, even front squatting is fine. Plenty of leg pressing, so on and so forth. And for benching, maybe some dumbbell bench, some camber bench, some close grip, something that's not irritate the same regions and structures that you're currently experiencing pain with and do that for several weeks, at least a mesocycle before you get back into any low bar squatting competition benching. I would also say the same thing probably goes for deadlift as well. James. Yeah, actually we, we had virtually the same recommendations. Uh, the only other thing I was going to say is just make sure you also take your frequency down when you get back to kind of quasi preparatory training. Don't, don't just do chest like one and a half times per week. Same thing yeah. with like squatting. And then you can ramp it up later. Yeah. Very good. And then also just make sure Liam to take your, Take your taper for this meet very seriously because you don't want to come into the platform with hurt anything. So make sure, basically, by the time you compete, you should already be halfway healed at least. And then the one to two week active rest after is just icing on the cake, right? Um, yeah, I think the active rest is a really good call in that case. And that, you know, kind of splitting hairs between like training at MV and, and active rest, kind of more or less the same idea, but the active rest gives you the total psychological yeah. relief as well, which is good. All right. One of my favorite names of, in the universe, Declan. What a fucking I know, sweet that's name. A, that's a sweet name. Declan, Declan Ward. Oh. Uh, he's like, he's the kind of guy that you, you hire when your company's not doing well. Well, we need an idea, man, see? Yeah. And Declan's <laughs> like, man, it's me, see? I've got all sorts of ideas. I, he's, I was imagining like a business meeting. Like, we've hired this consultant to like tidy up our books. And he's like, let me see all your paperwork. And you're like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, Declan always does everything by the book. Fucking Declan. Hi, docs. Wondering if you could help explain some muscle physiology here. I'm a weightlifter and I've just come off a hypertrophy block where I hit a somewhat easy 8RM squat at 85% before immediately being crushed by some much lighter drop sets. <laughs> I tend to perform relatively better at higher rep range, 6 to 10, than lower reps. Okay. Right. To me, my inability to perform as expected at lower rep ranges and my tolerance of higher rep work would suggest a greater proportion of slower twitch fibers, but the steep drop in performance on the drop sets suggests the opposite. 
or could a lack of neural adaptations be what is hindering my one around performance? Um, okay, so then he goes unrelated to that. But so I'd like to answer this first question by saying that if you have slower twitch fibers, then that is a component uh, of what would end up having uh, you be better at higher reps than lower reps when percent is equated. Uh, but that is not the only factor by a long shot. There's tons of neural factors, architectural factors, psychological factors, and the list goes on. So if you are unable, so you know, the way you tell if you're slow twitch or fast twitch is really through muscle biopsy in multiple sites. Nobody's going to do that. So you, what you want to do is sort of tally up a bunch of pieces of evidence, not just one. So for example, the fact that you're better at reps than at maxes is a piece of evidence for potentially being more slow twitch than not. But what about drop off set to set? Okay, that needs to be pretty fucking good or rather not awful if you're going to, so check that box as well for slow twitch versus fast or slower versus faster. You don't check that box. Okay, so that's not. what about hypertrophy tendency? Like if you hypertrophy a lot from lifting, then you're probably faster twitch than slower twitch. If you hypertrophy pretty well, then okay, there goes the slow twitch on that. And you can go on down the line with multiple other analyses from performance uh, and behavior and adaptation. And all those together start to tilt the, you know, the likelihood into the direction of, yeah, I'm probably more slower twitch than not. Another one is, you know, history of competition beforehand. Like if you used to run marathons at a just sub-Olympic pace, I guarantee you your legs are slower twitch than faster twitch. Otherwise it's impossible, right? But if you used to be a very good sprinter and you were never good at endurance, it's unlikely with many other factors that we can be convinced that you're a very slow twitch person. So yes, that one piece of evidence does support that you may be slower twitch, but it could be a bunch of different things. And the fact that you drop a lot of reps set to set to set does not support the slower twitches, but it could also be a bunch of other things. So based on everything you've said, I would personally, you'll see what James says, um, I'm, I'm not comfortable concluding about your fiber type whatsoever. And there would need to be a whole lot more evidence in multiple columns for us to start to uh, figure out the fiber type. In addition to that, if you've collected all the pieces of evidence, like how your muscles respond to various things, the fiber type guess is almost pointless because now that you have an, an idea about how your muscles respond and how they perform, that's just how you train them. You know what I mean? So the answer of, well, what does this mean for my fiber type is really relevant when you've connected, you know, collected everything. It, it's almost like, you'd be like, do I have the receptors to really enjoy eating hot dogs versus hamburgers? Like, is that how my taste works? Or like, which one do you like? Hot dogs or hamburgers? Well, I love hot dogs. You're like, well, it doesn't matter what we tell you about taste receptors. You seem to like hot dogs anyway. How would you use that information in any other way than to buy more hot dogs? But you already have that information. So hopefully that makes sense, James. Yeah, that was really good. I have kind of two points to add to that. So based on going off of what you just said, like, what do you do with that information? You're also constrained by the specificity of weightlifting, right? So even if you did sure. determine that you were a more slow twitch guy, what does that mean? You're going to start doing 15s for weightlifting? Like, yeah, slow twitch weightlifting, James. You'd lift right? the bar slower and shit. <laughs> so it's kind of one of those things where like, okay, well, if you want to keep doing weightlifting, then you still got to lift heavy, even if you're not particularly good at it, right? Or, you know, on the mod, maybe the moderate slide scale of heavy for power output, right? Um, the other thing too is like just to play devil's advocate to to what Mike was saying. Not even not even devil's advocate, but just to highlight some other ideas that this why, why we can't say like you might also just be experienced. Like so, he said, I hit a somewhat easy eight RM squat before immediately being crushed by some lighter uh, drop sets. Well, you might have gotten crushed because you were more fast twitched in that first set just fucking wiped you out, right? And then you're just done at that point. So you could go both directions and say like tit for tat, like which, which one is indicating which, which way. And as Mike said, it's very hard. You need a lot of other kind of pieces. So I don't know. And I think if your goal is to be a weightlifter, like don't put too much thought into it. You're going to have to train heavy. If your goal is to be like a physique person, then it might be worth exploring that a little bit more. 100%. And then he follows up with unrelated to that is an athlete's ability to grind out a one arm squat indicative of their fiber type profile, or is it too multifactorial to have any good idea of what is going on? Definitely too multifactorial. I would yeah. never ever guess fiber type based on one performance type. Um, I'm thinking there are times when an athlete has what looks like an easy rep, but then is completely unable to lift just a few kilos more. Uh, yeah. I mean like that, you know, that is a piece of a maybe 10 point evidence scale. And if the other nine points point one way and that one points this way, then, you know, it's probably the other thing. And if it's five to five or four to six, then you really just can't conclude a whole lot. And There's also kind of a time scale thing. And this is pertinent to strength sports because um, you might, you might have somebody doing like reps in the one to five range. Like let's say they came off a hypertrophy block and this is their first like kind of strength E block. 
And the first time they get to some heavier weights, they all might look like grinders, but three months from now, they might look smooth as fuck, you know? 100%. So it's kind of hard to say if it's just, if you're just observing this like a, as a one-time thing, yeah. eh. but Same as it goes trend. for drop off, you're just out of shape. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and he says something very important. I didn't know RP plus existed until I saw the webinars on YouTube. So thanks for putting them out there. Woo. Ooh, this is speaking great. of uh, uh, mental note. I don't think we have the, the one from last time up on YouTube yet. I've got to double check. I checked like a few minutes ago and it wasn't posted. So it's not the one from 1120. I think there was one in between. Wasn't there? Maybe there should have been. Yeah. I think there right. was because 1120 was like, yeah, you're totally right. Now, luckily there's some more questions on 1120 that we haven't seen yet, but um, Jamo, can you, can you please message Mr. Hoon about that? Is this, do I do Scott or Jonathan? Uh, Scott. Okay. I'll message him. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. All right. James Mendelhall. Related by almost last name to Scott Mendelson. Yeah, very, very similar. I love to like, when I see people like this in person, I like to be like, are you related to Scott Mendelson? They'll be like, that's not even the same last name. I'm like, it's close. Are you closely related? Be like, get the fuck out of my face. <laughs> or Scott Malkinson from South Park. Yeah, another excellent question. <laughs> Isn't that even a real person? Uh, hello, uh, preface for my questions with some personal specifics and long-term goals. Currently 220 and 20%, it would like to be 200 to 210 and float between 10 to 15 percent. Kilos. Five, ten. <laughs> yeah, that'd be so sweet. Be like, you should do strong, man. Um, isn't it funny that Hofdor Bjornsson is 200 right? kilos? At right? That's insane. That's insane. Uh, haven't done anything like a strength or peaking block in a long time, but at a similar body weight in the past, I've squatted 415 and deadlifted 495 and benched 335. Um, uh, would also like to improve cardiovascular condition for health and recreational sport purposes. So you just want to become Superman. Got it. Mm-hmm. A few questions. Starting in January 2020, I was planning on doing a strength block followed by a power block, 48 weeks of each, depending on how they go. However, I would also like to get leaner. Would it make more sense to cut first or cut after? Cut first. I'm somewhat detrained. Last two years have been inconsistent, but I've maintained most of my strength and size. I'm starting my second month of consistent six-day week training, four sessions with weights and two indoor soccer games with enough sprinting to give me mild doms. I do want the power block to feel a bit more explosive and athletic again. So we're dropping 20 pounds to be better for this goal. Uh, I, so James, let's tackle these one by one. I yeah, think yeah. my advice is because you're still sort of detrained, your strength block will not go as well as you want it to if you cut, but I think you could cut between, I mean, so like if it's eight weeks, I would say you can cut up to 10 pounds. Uh, I wouldn't cut any more than that. And I think you will be a little lighter on your feet. I would absolutely not cut 20 pounds in eight weeks. Mm -mm. Do not cut during the power block. Only cut during the strength block and prepare for much less improvement. In Wait, strength. does he, does he mean cutting during the strength block or before, before both of those? Oh, I, I, well, he had us, he said starting in January 2020, I was planning on doing a strength block followed by a power block. Okay. okay. I interpreted that as like, should I cut before I start any of this? Sure. He says, would it make more sense to cut first or cut after? If, I, I'm interpreting cut first to be like cut during, but if, oh, he, if okay. he means cut during, then you know, when you cut doesn't really make much of a difference, but if you want to peak in power at the end of the power block, you should already be lean. So it makes more sense to cut before, but don't cut during, certainly don't cut during power. And if you cut during strength, you're going to have to trade off some abilities. Yeah. So um, I totally agree with Mike on that. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is, is um, losing weight for the uh, explicit purpose of like being more powerful is not necessarily a good idea, but what I will say is if you want to make some major body composition change and you have like more athletic stuff that you're doing, like, let's just, let's just assume maybe he's playing soccer or something like that. Um, you're going to want to lose that weight before you move into your strength and power blocks, because it's going to take time for your body to calibrate to your new body size and body weight. And that will definitely change if you're doing stuff like sprinting. So the way that you sprint, you know, at your normal weight and the way that you sprint at 20 pounds lighter than your normal weight is significantly different from, from our perspective. So you would want to kind of be at your target weight before you entered that strength and then subsequent power blocks so that your body has time to adjust. And this is something that I've seen with my rugby guys where if they did a mass phase or they did a cut phase, we make sure that they had time to readjust because if you like for, on mass phase, for example, now you've got this extra ballast swinging around every time yeah. you jump and run and, and vice versa. And then it's gone and you have less of that and you have to adjust. So I would definitely, as Mike said, not cut during both of those. And maybe it might be worth just waiting until your more athletic stuff is kind of coming to a close and then you can do a cut later on. Yeah. Um, not sure. Yeah. Number two, because of the detrained fact, would it be possible to recomp some of a combination of dialed in eating and activity levels stated above? Also, I'm a professional painter, so my daily need is fairly high. I was moving 
on me feet a lot. Um, so, you know, some recomp is almost certainly going to happen if you just eat at maintenance because uh, you're relatively detrained. Absolutely. Would I bet that that recomp is going to be this grandiose thing that makes you a lot better? No, probably not. Yeah. Uh, especially like if you're not doing a lot of like hypertrophy stuff, you're probably not going to see a ton of recomp, but you'll definitely see some if you're doing strength training. Yeah. Number three, just, just as an intellectual, uh, I suppose not curiosity related to this recomp occurs best uh, given any, you know, sort of whatever training level you have with a high level of what I we could call throughput, like a lot of hypertrophy training and a lot of cardio causes a lot of recomp. The less you train, the less recomp you have. So yeah. 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 Uh, um, Number three, while getting back into training uh, the last few months, I've been doing a lot of alternating sets in a 10-minute imam fashion. James, what is imam? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I feel ashamed. I don't know. All I can think of is like stupid like <laughs> Star Wars type thoughts. Yeah, or like the imam. The, uh, imam that is like the uh, Muslim equivalent of priest. So he says, right. for example, Let me see. I'm gonna, <laughs> for example, I'm Google it. Imam. Bench press. Bench press. Minute Every minute one. on the minute. Every minute on the minute. Okay. Uh, bench press, uh, minute one, pull-ups, minute two, repeat, overhead press, minute one, barbell row, minute two. For five sets total, I have been getting great pumps and mild to medium doms the following days. I've seen you guys say straight sets are best. Am I spinning my wheels training like this? I've also been enjoying the different training styles. So here, check this out. It's a really, really cool insight. Um, uh, uh, we at RP have developed what we consider to be sort of a very logical approach to rest times. Um, and and is a, the, the key to hypertrophy training is that your rest times, uh, when you go again, that next rest, uh, that, was that next set is limited by the local musculature's ability to contract and not really by anything else, right? For strength, you are limited by your local musculature and your neural ability to generate high forces and not by anything else, like uh, synergist muscle limiting you or cardiovascular stuff limiting you. So how you know this is good training for hypertrophy and or strength is if you are not so out of breath that you're clearly losing repetitions and clearly not able to push the muscle and or the movement as close to failure as you would like. Um, and that's for you to answer. So if you're in real good shape, uh, every minute on the minute never really taxes your central, uh, never really creates the situation where cardiovascular stuff is a limiting factor, then it's great. You said you've been getting great pumps and mild to medium doms. That's you're well on your way for a lot of stuff. Is it ideal? It can be close to ideal if you recover really fast. But if, if and when you have the thought of, man, ugh, oh, I got to go in five seconds. But man, if I rest at another 30, this next set will go a lot better. Almost by definition, you are not spinning your wheels, but you're sure spinning them up a little bit and you would benefit from more rest. James? Yeah, and I think the kind of the take-home message there is that, um, that it's good maybe in some cases, but not all cases. So why put an arbitrary constriction like one minute on the minute? That, that, and that's, it's a perfectly fine way to do it if it gets you in the gym and it keeps you on a, a good routine and you're, you can manage it. That's great. Um, from an optimality standpoint, like that might be good for like um, your bench press, but it might be devastating for squats or something like that, right? So it's like, yep. why, why, why do that? You can just adjust as needed um, based on like your breathing and all the criteria that Mike already described, so... 100%. Luciano Bruno Quichel says, Hey, docs, I hope you're both well. Uh, great move bringing RP and RP Plus websites together. It looks so fancy now. Hey, uh, yeah. Ooh, uh, we fancy, our, huh? Yeah. Good job, Sonia. Uh, it looks so fancy now. That explains you guys are trying to improve your YouTube game for that YouTube incel money. You know, that <laughs> incel money that just, just delivers. We don't even have advertisements on ours at the moment. So we're not even getting any of that YouTube God incel money. That's true. Moving on, number one, why are studies demonstrating muscle memory, aka physiological memory, of previous muscular hypertrophy and strength training in humans lacking? I found literature on elevation of strength during detraining phases, which carries over to a retraining phase, but why has such an effect hardly been shown in regards to muscle hypertrophy? Is it due to the time constraints of the studies? If I have missed relevant studies, would you please uh, mind pointing me in the right direction? So I would point you to the James Krieger Research Review, weightology.net where a bunch of those studies are summarized and discussed in great depth. Best fucking website on, on the internet or damn near uh, one of them as far as training is concerned. Uh, there are not many of those studies uh, for two reasons. One, generally speaking, you can get easier funding on muscle memory and strength because you can get funding from institutions 
they're designed to research aging and age-related decrements, right? Um, strength is just easier to justify because you could say, hey, look, if you're not strong enough to get out of a fucking chair, you're going to have trouble being independent and all kinds of organizations that study medicine. And it's associated medicine, with like mortality and morbidity. Yeah, we'll, we'll give you money because you can justify it for function. Muscle hypertrophy is a little bit difficult to get money for because you can stretch it to say hypertrophy leads to strength, but by itself is you know, not super imposing. In addition to that, a lot of these studies require huge follow-ups with big cohorts to figure anything out. And that's really fucking difficult. So I think would say most of these studies, there's just not a lot of them. And that's my guess as to why the strength versus hypertrophy stuff. And I think there's just a lot more people interested in strength versus hypertrophy in the research. Um, hypertrophy is a very niche interest. Uh, and it turns out that you know, beach boy physique people don't really contribute to research or have a big, huh. you know, like strength training research in an advanced state has been occurring in the United States since the seventies and eighties dedicated hypertrophy research as it oh, yeah. doesn't relate to sport or, or, or anything like that has been occurring since the invention of Brad Schoenfeld in modern times, like in 2010. So yeah. <laughs> it's definitely behind the times uh, Luckily hypertrophy research is catching up like crazy, but it's still pretty, pretty lackey. We know way more about strength development than hypertrophy development at this point from the research. Maybe I'm being pedantic here, but I'm, I'm not fully understanding the, the question because what, what they would be measuring in both instances are essentially strength, unless I'm missing something. They would measure like satellite cells and cross-sectional area and stuff like that if they're really looking at hypertrophy and maybe with multiple measures. Like, so a lot of times you say like people retain their strength and regained it at a certain rate, but those, those studies won't come with like uh, any kind of... Um, ultrasound measurements or body cop measurements and because those a lot of times just i don't think interest researchers nearly as much as so, so is he is he asking about people who have like gained a significant amount of muscle mass and then deconditioned for a yes. long time okay that's, yes. that's i see so right. and that requires a hell of a hell of a study to do that so. gotcha yeah and it's also difficult to keep it's also out of the gym <laughs> yeah, well it's also difficult to just lose muscle mass that you've accrued over time just yeah. Even if even if you're not like getting at the gym all the time, yeah. Just, Actually, here here's another really interesting it. situation. So if you recruit people who never trained, train them for a while, and then later study their muscle memory. They actually don't have much of a muscle memory because it's been shown through uh, other studies that are much limited in scope that muscle memory actually increases the more you train. So if you train someone for 12 weeks and they lose all their muscle, a lot of times there is no muscle memory after a certain time. But what are, what are the kinds of people that really have a lot of muscle memory? and get back their size a lot. Well, advanced lifters, how the fuck do you get them to stop lifting? You basically right. can't because they already lift. <laughs> so a lot of the studies you get with people coming like back from injury and lifting again and how much yes. faster it goes on and so forth. So it's got to be pretty... Uh, I was going to say the only instances are like case studies of astronauts and people who get severely injured, right? That's the only time where you really see that effect. Yeah. And then number two is what's your take on the cellular and neural physiology of muscle memory? The myonuclear domain theory still seems to be up in the air. We seem to have equal amounts of studies on both sides in mice and humans. Uh, and then he starts to study there. Uh, as far as I'm familiar with the literature, the um, myonuclear domain theory is uh, pretty impressive. Uh, so I think it explains some of the uh, variants. I know there's a large neural component as well. And this has been seen in a, in a variety of ways. So for example, the cross-training the uh, studies is really, really powerful data. So you know, when you train your right arm, your left arm just doesn't lose nearly as much muscle as you would expect, which is fucking crazy because the muscle physiology isn't doing dick. Um, so there seems to be a, a top-down ability of the nervous system to upkeep muscle size, which really is fucking impressive. Um, and there's so, more recent evidence, too, that suggests that um, like mental imagery in practice can actually help you maintain your muscle mass uh, yeah. or, or prevent you from deconditioning worse. Nuts. Totally nuts. So there's a lot of stuff in addition. So I don't think that the myonuclear domain theory explains all the evidence, but I think it explains a good deal of it. But always, so, uh, always up in the air. Yeah. A lot of the stuff we just don't know. Jordan Sanef says, hello, I have a pretty good understanding of the periodization principles taught by RP, but after reading the mini cut manual, I'm having a bit of trouble coming up with a good way to periodize oh, my training. son of a bitch. Mini cuts just always fucking up. He's read the mini cut book and we're still doing mini cut questions. You That's bastard. So <laughs> you bastard. <laughs> While incorporating mini cuts during my massing phases, the book recommends around three to four weeks. Oh, sorry, sorry. Three, around three, Times. four week mesocycles yeah. of massing followed by around one four-week meso cycle of cutting, another two four-week uh, mass mesos, two-week maintenance, one meso of cutting, one meso of massing and finishing off with a meso of maintenance. The book does not recommend this at all. It is an example to illustrate a theory. 
just to be very, very clear, I'm not trying to be a pedantic asshole. It doesn't recommend this. It's just an example that allows us to explain and explore all the nuances involved. As a matter of fact, that last one meso of cutting, one meso of massing, I would just cut that off entirely and just go to maintenance if I was doing a real world thing. But as far as illustrations are concerned, it, we put it in there mostly to illustrate that after a while, mini cutting no longer provides a time efficient solution to resensitize the process. I hope that makes sense. James, does that make sense to you what I'm saying? Yeah, but I guess maybe I'm not a good good person to gauge that on, you know? <laughs> right. Okay. I, it will, at it least if it, if it didn't me, make yeah. sense to you, then I was total bonk, right? So right. <laughs> basically, it's one of those things like uh, if you want to show someone like how many hours they can sleep a night and still retain performance, you can show like, you know, you can sleep six hours and then sleep five and then sleep four and then sleep three, but you can't keep sleeping three. Like three right. hours yeah. will buy you more time to be able and active, but after three cycles of that, you're just dead no matter what. <laughs> yes. So same idea. And then he says, so just to keep that in, in perspective. And then he says, that all makes perfect sense after reading the book, but how do I fit slash adjust the standard uh, meso basic hypertrophy, meso two basic hypertrophy, meso three metabolic, meso four resensitization strength block, Within the mini cut guidelines, one would think that the resensitization meso met would fit nicely within the mini cuts, but the book, uh, but both the strength focus of the meso and the low volume make me think it's definitely not the best suited for losing weight due to much lower hypertrophy stimulus. Mini cuts are supposed to have a low hypertrophy stimulus, right? So you 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 don't. Uh, so first of all, second of all, and he says that input would be highly appreciated. You bet. So the basic hypertrophy basic hypertrophy metabolite resensitization is a periodization structure we chose to put into our templates. It is absolutely not the only one. It is for people that don't really know what the fuck is going on because they're experts at something else like their actual jobs and they just want a structure to follow that's pretty fucking good. That structure can be adjusted and adapted flexibly mm -hmm. to meet a variety of other structures, including the one you just described from the mini cut manual. Basically what you have to do is uh, go through and incrementally do more volume until you're too tired to do more volume and you take a break by doing a resensitization phase. And you take that and you intersect it with the fact that you have to do incrementally higher volumes during massing and that mini cuts should probably be in the lower end of volume, more like meso one basic hypertrophy kind of volumes that start with the first week-ish of volume and never go up because you're not increasing volume during a mini cut by adding sets. So taking the, that, those ideas, you have to take whatever, because here's another one, um, you're done. Your schedule might not exactly fit either one of those two things. So you have to understand these as concepts and then apply them. So for example, you say, okay, I have two months of massing. I can do two mass cycles. One's going to be moderate volume. The other's going to be moderate volume. Okay, because it's not enough time to go to super high volumes yet. Okay, sweet. And then I have one month of mini cut. That's enough time to do moderate volume to begin with, but never increase it. So it's actually low volume the entire time. After that, I start another mesocycle for two mesos because that's all I have time for. I'm pretty used to moderate volumes by now. Let me do a mesocycle of sort of moderate high volume in the single one. And then a second mesocycle, let's do really high volume. And then I'm going to do a maintenance phase that lasts about a week, uh, a week or two, and then another mini cut that's four weeks, again, with on the low end of moderate volumes. That's how you construct that stuff. You layer your plan out and you layer down ideas that make sense, aligning each phase to what it needs, and then it's going to make sense. We can't possibly give the periodization for everything because people's individual needs and schedules vary so much that you have to come at it from the perspective of ideas and phases and concordance. James? Yeah, that was brilliant. Uh, if I could just give like a TLDR, um, you can basically take that same structure if it fits your schedule. And yeah, you can basically substitute the resensitization phase with a mini cut because it will be just enough for you to kind of keep your muscle mass while you're losing weight and resensitize you at the same time. And then you can go on to do more massing. Um, but that's highly variable depending on what you want to get out of it and, and, your, and your timeline. So don't fuss too much about it. Really is kind of the idea. It's like just yeah. pepper it in when, you, when there's a good time, usually after at least two mesos of mass, and then go from there. Yeah. So like you also ask yourself questions. Okay, I'm on a, uh, a mini cut. Is the current volume I'm doing enough to keep muscle on my body? You should be able to auto-regulate that. Like if you're getting zero pumps, zero everything else, and you seem to be losing muscle week to week to week, it's probably not enough volume. But if you get just the minimum amount that you need to maintain, it should be pretty obvious as to how that goes. Once we publish the book, keep saying this all the time, 
it's going to be, I was going to say it's going to be more clear. It's going to be more informative. I'm not sure how clear it's going to be because the book's quite complicated, but uh, it's certainly going to be more accessible. It's a doozy. Yeah. All right. Aiden, one name. It's like Prince. Yeah, I think it was Aiden Brown, but I think after we updated the website, sometimes it only shows part uh-huh. of the, the profile. Okay. Aiden says, hi, Mike and James. I have a question around muscle soreness in session MAV. I'm currently in week two of my mass phase and I've started with moderate levels of soreness in week one. And I'm now wondering what soreness should look like through the meso. Should you keep adding volume and intensity so that you get just shy of soreness slash low moderate levels of soreness throughout the whole meso while in the last couple of weeks get a bit more soreness than normal functional overreaching effect? Maybe. The answer is maybe. So with soreness, the state of the evidence so far and our reasoning about it can be summarized like this. If you're not, if your goal is hypertrophy, you're not getting at all sore, you have to answer the question of why not do more work because more work has been shown if you're very easily recovering to lead to more hypertrophy. So if you're not getting sore at all, you should probably do more work. On the other hand, if you're so fucking sore that you can't train properly in the next session, you're probably too sore from two potential negatives. One, you're interfering with overload by being unable to train. Well, three negatives. Another one is you're risking injury because you're training in a a pre-broken state. And three, you may be exceeding the amount of damage your muscles can recover from without dipping into the adaptive resource pool and fucking over how much you're growing. So that leaves us with the following. When you're training, so long as your performance is still good, you should seek to increase volumes so that you stay above, not sore at all, but below so fucking sore that you can't heal by the next session. Anything within that is probably fine. And we actually have no idea what the specifics of very little soreness, moderate soreness to high but still recoverable soreness. James and I can't tell you which one of those is better because we literally would just be making it up. We have no idea. Um, Is there... It, it, because we want to have a nice, extensive, long mesocycle and we want room to grow and room to adapt, is there some logic for starting out at the low end of soreness and as the mesocycle goes in, adding volume to move into the higher end of still workable soreness? I think there's uh, definitely room for that, at least to some extent. How much of an extent? No clue. So just make sure if you're not sore at all, probably add some volume. If you're super fucking sore to the point you can't recover on time for your next workouts, don't add volume you maybe even want to reduce it, James. Yeah, that was really good. And I think kind of the take home here is like, you shouldn't, your strategy shouldn't avoid soreness nor chase soreness for its own sake, right? It's more of like, you can use soreness as another one of many proxies to indicate that you are probably in a good place. That's why we also recommend looking at your performance, your pumps, you know, the, how much mind muscle connection. Like we always have a couple things that we're throwing into the mix and soreness is one of the ones that we can use, but don't chase soreness necessarily for its own sake, nor should you, think that you should be avoiding soreness like if you get really sore from doing stiff legged deadlifts you shouldn't be like oh my god i should never do that again right no it's probably did exactly what you wanted it to do so somewhere in the middle is probably the right the golden zone we just can't quite narrow it down yet Also, my plan is set up to where I have three upper and three lower days, one focusing on, for example, chest with two chest exercises back to back and then a back exercise and some isolations. My plan follows a setup with all major muscle groups. So a quad focus day, hand focus day, shoulder focus day, et cetera. Uh, we don't need we- a shoulder focus day. Sure. Other than that, I think your plan is good. Because um, remember the show, which part of the show? Maybe I'm just reading too much question. into that. Maybe that just yeah. means he starts with the shoulder exercise. Yeah, no, no, no. He does focus day. Right, right. Yeah, so he yeah. still trains the other stuff. In week one, as mentioned previously, I experienced moderate levels of soreness due to all the new exercises I introduced. However, in week two, I'm not only getting low levels of soreness and some muscles aren't getting sore at all. Even though I am on plus five sets and some exercises, pumps throughout the workout are a medium level. And if there's some stiffness and weakness in the following hours after I train, could this mean that I have a high session MAV and can benefit from more volume? Yeah, it might. Yeah. Yeah. Even though or, in the or sessions, it's going up, right? It's going up yeah. all the time. That would be another. It, it does absolutely do that. Issue. Even though in the sessions, there is only one exercise for the muscle group. I'm approaching seven sets, which I've heard you say going past. This isn't the best. And another exercise should be added. Yeah. Probably going past five isn't even the best. Um, I think you should split seven sets of the same exercise. It does not sound like the greatest thing for me from a stimulus to fatigue perspective and just from a psychological fucking boredom perspective. Good God. Um, yeah, there's some, I think there are some where you can really get into a good groove and it might be like for me, like I can do um, a lot of sets of like easy curls. That's one where I really yeah, get like a raises. good or like lateral raises, but like squats, bench press, like no, like yeah. you gotta, 
move on. But adding any other, adding any exercise once the meso was started can interfere with recovery. True, but it shouldn't interfere with recovery much if you add one set of it. So for example, we reach five sets of bench press. The next week you do five sets of bench again, you do one set of dumbbell presses. But that's not going to interfere with your recovery. If the last week five sets of bench press saw you way, way recovered and it was not remotely a challenge, there's no way one set of dumbbell presses is going to throw off everything. When people add exercises in, they add four sets of them at a time. That's where we get into trouble. So I wouldn't worry about adding one set. But for next time, you might know that you have a high session MAV. You might want to start with two exercises instead of one and then jack up the volume like that so that there's no surprises midway through the rest. That's where I was going to go. So it's, it's, there's nothing wrong with adding an exercise, but it's best to do that with that in mind at the start of the mesocycle. So instead of adding like a whole nother exercise midway through, have that already in the mix and then just add sets as you go. So it's not like this crazy big variable thing week to week. Yep. Yep. All right. And then he says more questions on the JPS podcast, talking about this topic, you mentioned that people who have done high frequency programs don't really get sore as they become so well accustomed to it that their muscles know what to do when damage takes place. I myself have been going through a fat loss phase where in the meso, I tried out all big muscle groups four times a week and went into five times a week in the final meso. I was really careful with excess selection and session volumes and it was successful. But like you say, it was certainly not sustainable on my knees and other joints. I felt like oh, they were yeah. going to crumble. Totally. Oh, yeah. Now into my mass phase, do you think that I have experienced these higher frequencies that my muscles know how to heal with soreness and and is why for my previous, previous question, either last week in this current webinar that I rarely get sore, even though my session volumes are in the six to 12 sets per session. Yeah, sure. There's, there's some adaptation to that, right? So your muscles get mm-hmm. very good at recovering if you train them a lot. Part of that is fiber type shifting um, and, and many other uh, contributors. And it's, it's absolutely the case. But remember, as you train with lower volumes for a while, you're going to eventually get to a place where you uh, de- sensitized to the higher frequencies and you'll start to get responsive again. This is one of the reasons why after a very long, very extensive cut at some point doing a maintenance phase is a good idea to resensitize, to get the very low frequencies, very low volumes where after you're done with that, even moderate volumes and frequencies are pretty fucking gnarly because you're fully resensitized. But if you never resensitize, uh, um, then you have, unfortunately, the situation where you can crank out fuckloads of volume and dick happens to you, which is not the greatest thing in the world. And so we've talked about this more explicitly, like the scenario that you run into there is right where your MEV and your MAV are creeping up and flirting with your MRV, right? So at that point, like you have to do so much training to get anything out of it anymore. You're right at that breaking point. So at that point, when you find yourself flirting with volumes and session volumes where you're like, this seems really ridiculous for me to really get anything out of this that's probably a good indicator that you are due for a low volume phase, whether that's active rest or resensitization. That's like the classic indicator, like you're feeling flat all the time and you have to do like seemingly an astronomical amount of stuff compared to what you would normally do. Definitely time for a resensitization phase. Boom. So, um, to answer a question that's coming up, let me pull up the... He says, last question, other than soreness, uh, is there other proxies that I can rely upon to gauge when to add volume? Yes. Go on renaissanceperiodization.com and go to the expert uh, advice guide or just Google uh, set progression algorithm renaissance. And the second link that pops up is training volume landmarks for muscle growth. And you're going to scroll down and just read the whole thing because it's a fucking baller article. And... Um, you get to something called the set progression algorithm, which tells you exactly how to add volume, which is fucking awesome. Um, And it relies on a couple of other things. Those other things we're actually not going to answer right now because Joseph Heslop actually asks about them. So we'll just get two birds with one stone. He's our next question. Oh, snap. Joseph Heslop says, hi there. I've spent some time researching the best training practices, RP, JTS, various sport journals, and shamefully, just sometimes YouTube. <laughs> it's okay. yeah. no, there's no shame in it. Well, we're I on sp- YouTube now, so. Yeah, seriously. What go. kind of shame are you talking about? <laughs> shame of this? Uh, I spent a large portion of my time endlessly obsessively theorizing over new training methodologies that I may improve the way I do things. Hey, welcome to our lives. But I've had this one rattling around for some time now. I want to shoot it at... Uh, the best in the business and see what you guys think. Oh. Well, James Krieger is not on this podcast, so you should um, shoot it at him. Okay. 
So splitting the body into any number of sections, uh, for this example, it would be push-pull legs. You pick a big lift that incorporates all slash most of the musculature of the that section, say bench press for the push section. That's probably the easiest example. Mm. And train solely that lift until volume landmarks for it have been established. Preceding this... Maybe. <laughs> James is already skeptical. Preceding this, you Just add a new... from the last question where we said it might not be good to fill your whole session with one exercise. Sure, 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 sure. I think this is more of like a intellectual experiment. We'll see where yeah. this goes. Preceding this, you add in a new exercise, perhaps vertical pushing or isolations for chest press or front delt, side delt, and see how this changes the previously established volume line for your bench press. Uh, uh, it's actually very difficult to find out volume landmarks for bench press, which is something we'll get to later. Um, you have yeah. volume landmarks for body parts. Uh, it's difficult to change. To So basically, like, let's say you're doing uh, dumbbell flies and bench press in your routine every week, and you hit your MRV. It's difficult to tell which one of those caused your MRV. Your chest has an MRV. Your bench press doesn't really have an MRV unless it's the only thing you do. And it sure does have an MRV, but you don't know which part of that is flies. Um, it could be exactly the perfect analogy. Um, when you eat a giant bowl of pasta, did you get full from the noodles or did you get full from the sauce? Uh, you can only find that out by eating noodles and sauce individually, which I would not recommend. <laughs> um, yeah. But then once you mix them, it's a different uh, thing altogether. So Yeah, it's... I'm sorry, like I don't mean to cut off the question early, but I, or there's just a, or a big flaw that I just want to point out real quick. So you don't figure out your volume landmarks for, let's say, your chest, right? And then later say, okay, how does adding other exercises affect my volume landmarks for chest? Usually when you're doing this, you're going to be doing it in like the most ecologically valid state, meaning yep. doing it in the way that you would most likely do it on any given day, right? Which is probably going to be some type of balanced program, right? Not like a completely, like Mike said, like pasta without the sauce. It's like, okay, my program's not bench press only. And then I'm adding things and seeing how it affects my bench press. A normal program will have all of these things and they will all be affecting each other. So that's kind of the, the issue I'm taking. Yeah. But I, the idea, I see where you're going, but just keep that in mind. Sure. He says a reduction in the MRV of your bench press can indicate that the additional exercise was wholly or in part unnecessary due to the exercise stimulating a muscle that may already be the limiting factor for your bench press indicated by the drop in MRV. We can't say it was unnecessary because it could actually be better than the bench press in many respects at what the bench press is doing. Um, so it, it's, it's like it's a stupid analogy. You're trying to blow up a car and you're using a really small gun. You use 500 bullets in the gun and you use like one rocket launcher and it blows up the whole thing. You said, well, I was at bullet, you know, 499 then. I would have just done it already with a small gun. Why are we using the bazooka? Well, the bazooka may be more efficient, right? Now, will the bazooka interfere with how many bullets it takes to destroy the car? Yeah, absolutely. But that may be a good thing. So for bench pressing, you know, let's say you do incline dumbbell press. It's going to interfere with your bench press for sure. I wouldn't call it unnecessary. It could just be another really good option. They're both competing for the same adaptive and recovery resources, but one of them may be better than the other, or they could be really complementary, which is most often the case, right? You do some bench, some incline dumbbells, it hits slightly different areas, raises your overall stimulus to fatigue ratio, and then you're good to go. So I wouldn't say unnecessary, but you could say it does use many of the same uh, uh, muscles, but that's not exactly uh, something we can for sure conclude. And uh, I'll answer this with your next question. It says, do the exercise stimulate a muscle and may already limit factor? Little or no change in MRV can indicate that the additional exercise is not interfering with whichever muscle is limiting factor for bench press and therefore providing a new stimulus to the other muscles. Yes, it can also indicate that it is just very non-systemically interfering. So for example, yes, yes. if a muscle, if you introduce deadlifting into your bench press program- That was what I was gonna say, God damn it. Ah, sorry, JMO, we all have the goddamn clones of each other at this point, we've been working <laughs> together for so long. Yeah, so you know, you deadlift a long time or for a lot and it, it brings your bench press down. It doesn't use any of the muscles. It just spills over into systemic MRV. So you got to be very careful. Some of these conclusions are a sort of, they're true as far as they go, but they don't go far enough, right? Yeah, it, absolutely. If an exercise brings down your bench press um, recovery ability, it interferes somehow, but how it interferes is not so clear just because it interferes. Um, and then, so he says, little or no change in MRV can indicate the additional exercise is not interfering with whichever muscle is limiting factor of your bench press. True. And therefore providing a needed stimulus to other muscles. So it, it's by no means clear those muscles need a stimulus, right? The best way to figure out what muscle needs a stimulus is you decide which muscle needs a stimulus and you track its own MRV, the muscle's MRV, and see if you're meeting enough volume to get close to it at the end of mass cycles. For example, you know, if squats don't interfere with your bench press, that doesn't mean your quads needed to be trained. How do you know they need to be trained? Because you want to fucking train them. You want bigger quads, right? Then you track your squatting and quad performance to see how what its MRV is, and then you figure out if that needs to be trained or not. 
Um, and he says this process could be repeated so that all muscles in a section are accounted for. Ah, okay. So if we're doing section by section, then this is probably a bit uh, more of a valid concern, but again, it doesn't address the systemic spillover. So for example, if you're doing, uh, you know, uh, you're training your bench press and your pecs are getting most of the work, your triceps are getting some, if you start doing skull crushers, your triceps could very well be getting great stimulus and growing much more and improving your long-term abilities. But in, including anything that trains your triceps will automatically fatigue them more because triceps and chest are part of what uh, hits your bench press. Your bench press will experience a decline in its MRV if you include skull crushers. But that doesn't mean they're bad or unnecessary. That just means that your total recovery ability and your whole pushing complex is finite. So... How do you find out if your triceps really need the work is you actually have to go about and find out what the limiting factor to your bench press actually is. And there's, I've got a whole lecture series on YouTube for free about how to figure out limiting um, muscle groups. And this sort of calculation is part of it, but it's not the only part. Um, and he says the aim would be through trial and error to construct a close to optimal program in the way of exercise selection and set dosages by the addition and subtraction of additional movements in response to that memory of a base movement, bench press varies. Unfortunately, it's not tenable because these things change all the fucking time. They change in a nonlinear way with the addition of different types of exercises. Yes. So in order to do the combinatorics of figuring all that out, it would take you like 15 years to figure out how the exercises intersect and then you would retire. And then here's like the, the, the easiest way to see this problem where you say, okay, I figured out my bench press, right? But now I've been using bench press for five months and it's gone yep. stale on me, yep. right? And I have to use something else. Now your whole, your whole scheme just gets thrown out the window at that point. So totally. now you should have an informal idea about what your bench press MRV is and an informal idea about how much other shit affects it. So you could say, okay, I'm doing like four to six sets of bench right now. How many sets of skulls can I add without my bench really tanking? Or with how many sets of skulls, rather without my bench really tanking is a bad question. How many sets of skulls, skulls can I add to cost me how many sets of bench of equivalent fatigue? You can get an understanding of that through careful tracking, exercise by exercise. It's always approximate, but it's going to be like, well, you know, two sets of skulls doesn't really fuck me up, but two sets of close grips really fucks me up. And then two, four sets of tricep extensions on a cable basically doesn't even... Um, you know, touch me at all. So I know that when I want to dose in other stuff, I know roughly which dosages to begin with and always titrate after bioregulation. Yeah. And I think that might just be one of these situations where you just, you, you just kind of have a general idea for your, your best SFR movements for your chest, for example, here's kind of the range of scores of the other things that I would be doing, whether or not it's a barbell bench press or a low incline dumbbell bench press, like they're going to be roughly the same. And I know that the spillover from my other high SFR accessory movements are going to be roughly the same or within mm -hmm. like a range of scores, mm -hmm. not like an exact hard line score necessarily. Yeah. I'm aware that variation through exercise selection and the accumulation of volume as a form of overload would complicate this methodology considerably. But I'd be interested in your opinion of this approach. I guess you got it. This idea was inspired by Matt Hasselman's principle of exercise selection, limiting factor, individual difference, and the work you've done at Volume Bio Marks. Thanks for your time, Joe. You're welcome for our time. Hopefully what we razzed about is somewhat instructive. And then he has another question. And the, I, I liked, I liked to, sorry, uh, I liked his thought process, like on the, the idea. I think mm -hmm. there was just maybe a few limitations on that, on that methodology, but sure. it's a good idea of like, how do I kind of systematically go from my priorities to my lesser priorities, right? That's the, kind of the idea. And that's good. Yeah. Hey there, Mike and James, quick question for finding your MEV. So in regards to finding MEV in the updated article, long, the long and precise way after meso, you analyze training results to see your performance of that meso question. What do you mean by performance? Is it in fact that while increasing the intensity each week for four weeks, I was able to hit the top end of a specific recommended rep range for that muscle group or movement. Or do you want us to say two to three RAR and hit the same exact rep count from previous weeks, um, matching set uh, for set rep wise? Uh, it's actually, so there's many ways to calculate performance, but because performance is a very objective, true thing that exists in the world, the many ways converge and they're all just sort of roughly equivalent pluses, pluses and minuses way to get the job done. Um, yeah. And it could so be a combination of some of those. Could things. be a combination of ways. Uh, so here, here's a real simple one. Um, you track your average, uh, you know, you, let's say one mesocycle, you hit certain weights for certain reps. The next mesocycle, you hit some of those same weights for who knows how many reps, right? 
you know, some of the weights you hit were different because you hit on average more, but a bunch of the weeks are going to have you lifting the same weight. You take all the weeks in meso one and meso two in which you lifted the same weight and you take the average reps for any given number of sets, like for three sets for this week and for three sets this week, what was the average rep number that I hit for the same weight? Once you do that, you see which average is higher. Like, how do you know you're stronger? Well, last time you did 405 for 466, and then this time you did 405 for 878. Like, clearly you're fucking stronger this time, right? You just compare reps or compare weight between, you can compare weight, you can compare reps, it doesn't matter. Uh, whichever way you do it, it's whatever is mathematically a higher performance on average, meso to meso. You don't even have to do on average. You can do peak weeks only. That's a real easy, quick way to do it. Yeah. It's got some inaccuracy to it, but it works pretty well. Like when you're going close to failure, which meso was better, the first or the second? Okay. And you can even you can use the RIR stuff too. You could say like, okay, well, I used the same weight, but before when I did this weight, it was an RIR of one. Now it's an RIR of three, and I got the same reps. Boom, yeah. I got stronger. That's it, hundred percent. Um, also when using the long method of finding MAV, should the testing be constrained to just, uh, two months? I asked, cause I've seen revive stronger podcast than MAV with Mike and it was stated that it was a good idea to test for two months. Um, this is before the update article says so recommendations still hold up. What we should really be doing is comparing one mesocycle to the next and your last, if, if, so if there's one mesocycle of focus, it's not two months, just one mesocycle, however you construct it, right? You ask the question is, is this mesocycle at min MEV or is it above MEV or is it below MEV? right? If your performance in this mesocycle compared to the last one you did before that did not go up, then by definition, you're at maintenance volume. If it went down, you're below maintenance volume. If it went up a lot, you're probably above minimum effective volume. And if it went up just a little bit noticeably, you're probably pretty close to MEV. That's mm -hmm. it. Yeah. So it's always, it's not two months, it's just a mesocycle or whatever that is to you. Um, Excellent. Yep. Number three, also, if you're a beginner, is it better to record your session performance soreness, pump, et cetera, along with your stats. Uh, I think if you're a beginner, you could probably go and get away with recording none of that shit. You could be, <laughs> <what> <laughs> <I was gonna> say. <laughs> you could be focusing on uh, having excellent technique with multiple sets of five to 10 reps, really becoming just a technique cycle. And then as you turn into an intermediate, beginning to really focus on relative intensity, pushing the sets a little bit closer to failure each time to really get to know what that means while maintaining your perfect technique. Later, as you become more uh, from intermediate to an advanced, you can start to focus on my muscle connection. And during this whole time, you start to take better and better notes of what's going on. James and I are not big fans of people over recording notes when they're real beginners, because that tends to cause people to burn the fuck out. You know, the first, your first computer should be a fucking, you know, uh, an iPad that- uh, Yeah, I was gonna say they, iPhone or yeah, something. <laughs> it, it's not, should, you don't go to, you know, Los Alamos laboratories and use their fucking deep blue quantum computer for the first fucking thing you ever do. So, because it could be a little overwhelming. <laughs> You know, like, hey, do you like computers, kid? Yeah, well, here's a three-month, you know, fucking Argonne National Labs internship. Like, wait, hold on a second. Whoa, I, whoa, whoa, whoa. I don't know if I like them for 16 hours a day. <laughs> like, so easy. we recommend easing in. Once you have good technique and you're trying to perfect it, because you're a beginner, you're going to get fucking great gains anyway. And you're setting yourself up for even better gains later. So once you have that, that's what beginners should focus on. Like if you want to focus on some of this stuff as a beginner, you want to nerd the fuck out. Hey, listen, you have our blessing. Just be careful that you don't overreach mentally and just hate the whole fucking thing. Yeah. I think that the, the need for like objective measures is really twofold, right? The, the more trained you are, the more that you might actually need to rely on objective measures to make sure that you're making progress and managing fatigue, but also like how engaged with the activity or sport you are. Like if you're just recreational, there's nothing wrong with just using a lot of subjective measures to do a lot of your stuff. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. Why? Because there's no need for you to have all this data. That's the thing. And Mike, I've heard Mike rant about this tons of times. Everybody loves to collect all this data and they have no idea what they're doing with it, right? Only the people who are becoming more advanced and are pursuing excellence in sport generally need more objective measures. The rest of us who are just recreational can do some objective, but mostly subjective. And that's perfectly fine. Yep. 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 Couldn't agree more. All right. To YouTube. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, oh, no. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Okie doke. Better than Instagram. Questions so far. Better than, <laughs> way better than Instagram. Yeah. Uh, pick a couple questions here. Let me see. How do I make the, how do I do with the share with the screen? Where's Oy. the email button? Did it work? Yeah. Excellent. All right. Uh, first is not a question. Uh, they Live We See says, this channel really put up great content in the last six months. Well, thanks. Thanks. Yeah. We actually just decided to just do more YouTube stuff. So there you go. 
Um, okay, this is actually a, a really good question that James and I can tee off on for a couple of minutes here. The question by EAR is, what would be the main exercises to test a 10 rep max or is it not needed? My mm -hmm. first submission, I'll see if James thinks it's good, is the exercises you actually are interested in. And the second complexity is you might never need to test a 10 rep max, just estimate it, James. Yeah, so I think that the need for 10 rep, rep max is purely based on how much objective stuff you want to do. So if you want to actually calculate loads based on a percentage of max, then you need to do a max. Which we do in our template, but you still don't even need to do that because you could just guess. And if you really guess, guess wrong, you still get a great hypertrophy stimulus, but next week you can make it a little heavier or lighter based on you just not having enough reps. So just, just for context, Mike and I, I mean, like our, our most true background is really in strength conditioning for you know sports right and of all the people in the world who think testing is important it's strength conditioning people mike and i tend to be on the the other end of the spectrum where you don't need to be spending a ton of time doing rep max testing why because you get all that same information when you go and train you get all that information without the huge massive fatigue of doing a maximal effort test or the time spent away from training so it's way less disruptive just to just get in the gym and train, see what happens, guess and check, and then adjust as you go. There's nothing wrong with that. Yep. All right, James, here's one for you. Elio CD says, my boxing coach suggests we shouldn't lift weights when going up a weight class as it slows you down and makes you stiff. True or false? Does How else muscle... are you supposed to go up a weight class? By eating. <laughs> By training less. Just getting fatter. Uh, does adding muscle aid in punching power or make you more resistant to punches? If so, how? He also said punching is a snapping motion, not a pushing motion. I can't, it can, I can't conceive any fucking stupider than that. Uh, with all due respect to your boxing coach, um, ask your boxing coach how he's going to punch with a torn pec and torn tricep, and we'll, we'll let us know if the pushing muscles are involved. Um, they'd be like, "Hey, do you want to fight Mike Tyson if both of his pecs and triceps get cut off?" And be like, "Yes, absolutely." <laughs> yeah. um, thanks, Mike and James. James. Okay, so I don't want to, uh, this is an easy one to tangent on, so I'm going to try and stay focused here, right? So let's tackle the first one. Shouldn't lift weights when going up a weight class as it slows you down and makes you stiff. So there is some, there is some merit, so we can play into it a little bit, to this idea. Weight training does make you sore and stiff and can impede your uh, speed performance uh, in the short term, right? But the benefit of doing the weight training is that it helps you put on muscle mass, which is going to, in the long term, increase your power, strength, and potentially your speed. So the strength training helps you gain weight that is productive to your sport, in this case, muscle mass, rather than just being fatter, right? And it has the long-term benefit of making you stronger, more powerful, and potentially faster, right? But that's a longer-term perspective. So with a proper periodized model, what you would see is some time spent doing hypertrophy weight training to build up more muscle mass. So like productive weight gain, not just fat weight gain. And then you would have transition times where now you have that new muscle mass, you're learning how to use it and get stronger. And once you're stronger, now you can actually use it to become more explosive. So that notion is just is fundamentally wrong in, in a, in a long-term sense, but there is some merit in the short-term sense. So if you have a fight coming up on Saturday, do you want to be doing, you know, 20 sets of bench press? No. I need smart. to put on muscle for this fight. <laughs> right. Exactly. So in that sense, he's right. But in like a properly like periodized um, scheme, it would be, I would say incorrect, but. Um, it's just, like having a, uh, a committee tour your city to give it like a beautification award. And you're like, we need to start building skyscrapers. Let's break the foundation of a huge building right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're like, what the fuck's with all this new construction? You're like, I guess you guys showed up earlier than we planned. <laughs> yeah. And like, there's also like a fundamental uh, question there. So it's like, if you're going to go up in a weight class and you are not trying to gain muscle, which is, you know, you would, you would need to do weight training to do that what is the other option, right? There's only one other option. That's to get fatter. How can yeah. you possibly recommend that that's necessarily a good idea? Uh, I've, yeah. It's a hard, hard sell, hard sell. Yeah, hard know. sell. Let's also look one of these things. Like if, if you're going to, you have to fight a guy that weighs 300 pounds. Do you want to fight a lard ass fuck? Or do you want to fight someone who's jacked to the fucking gills? I'm not fighting a jack guy. Fuck that. Almost no boxer. <laughs> every good boxer, every decent, every shitty boxer, almost everyone in boxing looks at a guy who's really jacked and they're like, do you want to spar against him? And they're usually like, God damn it. They're, you know, like, the competitive guys will spar with anyone. But when you ask them, like, hey, like you're having a rough day, you're hurting or something, who do you want to spar with? Super jacked guy or super out of shape fat guy who weighs the same? They're going to be like, of course not the jacked guy. What kind of fucking ridiculous idea is this? Like an MMA, you could say the same thing. MMA, boxing, wrestling, like the same muscle doesn't matter. Let's say strength doesn't matter. Does anyone actually believe that? You look at y'all Romero and you're like, man, fuck this guy. This guy's a clown. Like, what are you fucking kidding me? Like yeah. the shit. 
matter. It's muscle matters. That's why we have weight classes. Like I, I had a gentleman ask me, we're doing jujitsu, and one of my training partners, who's an MMA guy, he was like, uh, man, I, he's like, roll with me, Nogi. He's like, fuck, I thought you'd get tired and cramp up. Doesn't all that muscle cramp you up? I'm like, only if I push it too fast or too far, but like, if you don't know how to push it, then it's just an infinite wellspring of being jacked and annoying. Like anyone who's super fucking strong is going to be a fucking problem for people, plain and simple. So I I actually want a devil's advocate, our uh, devil's, what's it? uh, Shit. Devil's advocate. Devil's advocate, our position. Just so people don't think that we're a bunch of meatheads who only care about strength, right? Uh, Or only care about being jacked. Um, So let's take MMA as a really good example. So you can make a very good case that, some of the best MMA heavyweights were not those who were at the actual weight limit. They were usually somewhere around 240-ish pounds. Mm -hmm. So what that implies is that it's not necessarily in your best interest to be as jacked as possible or as heavy as possible, that there is some optimal body composition for each individual athlete at their weight class where they are very strong, they are not so muscled that they do fatigue easier, but they're not also carrying around a lot of extra I don't want to use the term non-functional, but they're not carrying around a lot of extra fat that's weighing them down. So the idea being that um, there is like an optimal competition body composition, right? Which is not necessarily the most muscled, right? Which is an easy, it's easy to say like you should be as muscled as possible. In some cases, yes, like weightlifting, powerlifting, that's an easy mm-hmm. sell. In something like boxing or MMA, you probably want the weight, the, a body composition that gives you the best output of strength and power without causing uh, a lot of adverse effects to your conditioning. Because some yeah. guys do gas easier when they're too heavy. And that's, that is a, a position you could take. Another thing is like, why don't you see super jacked guys in MMA or boxing? Uh, because reach right? Like mm-hmm. reach is the thing. Uh, I, if you weigh 150 pounds, you'd probably be like between 5'10 and 6'2", which is a pretty fucking skinny guy because a skinny guy can reach out and touch you when you can't touch him back. Like that's the best thing for MMA and for sure for boxing. And boxing, height is a huge advantage. The world heavyweight champs are all like 6'8". It's unreal. Like these people yeah. aren't even fucking humans anymore. Mm-hmm. So of course they're not going to be muscled up to the bone. But in, you know, uh, but, uh, you know, in a certain weight class, you want to have as much muscle and as little fat as possible. And if you could magically with no fatigue or training interference, increase muscle mass and decrease fat mass in a given fighter, it's always going to make them better. Case in point, steroids. What the fuck do you think steroids do? <laughs> Why do these guys take as much gear as they possibly can if gear's biggest effect is to gain muscle and lose fat? Like, of course it fucking helps. So, yeah. yeah. And what does that muscle do? It makes you better at the sport. It makes you hit people harder. That's a funny idea. All right. Uh, last question for today and for the YouTube questions, Simon L says, Hey, Mike question. How do you encourage people who have average or below average genetics? And he sees uh, genetically a plus fitness athletes, such influencer influencers slash PTs everywhere on Instagram in a motivation perspective. If someone is very passionate about bodybuilding, is there any other path, uh, than be a coach for them in their career perspective? This person also doesn't want to take AAS. Well, so here's uh, the best way I could possibly uh, encourage such a person if they wanted encouragement. So first of all, James and I are libertarian. We don't like to encourage people that don't want to do stuff because I don't give a fuck what you do. Like you might be a better computer programmer than weightlifter. Or the fuck would I push you into that? Um, computer programming is certainly more productive for society as a whole than lifting weights up. And down, <laughs> like that. Uh, try to get ba- try to get Bill Gates to work out. We're like, why? <laughs> uh, just do more Microsoft. Because I'm projecting my values on you. That's, that's why. Right. That's right. You should be as, like me in every way. So assuming that they were sort of feeling demotivated but really wanted to stick in the industry, well, what I tell them is this. This is actually a real, real interesting point. If you have not so good genetics, you have to earn all of your muscle the hard way. And then you won't be dick until and unless you figure out how shit really works and your margin for error is very, very small. So the the person who knows the most is the person who had to figure out the most about how to get their physique as far as their genetics allowed. Um, uh, you know, there's tons of folks involved uh, in the industry which neither take uh, AAS nor have a ton of... um, really good genetics. I'll bring up uh, my arch nemesis. My, it's not my arch nemesis. I can't take credit for this. Lyle McDonald has uh, apparently dog shit genetics, right? Uh, yeah. And I'm not so sure how consistent he is in his lifting, although he says he is. Uh, you know, for how big Lyle has ever gotten, assume he ever lifted anything, he clearly has awful genetics. Um, you know, other than being an asshole and having some interesting idiosyncrasies, Lyle knows his shit like real well. And it would, you know, his baseline of knowledge would make anyone a better coach. Um, 
uh, you know, Lyle probably knows a lot of shit because he had to struggle versus take some guy who's amazing genetics, looks like a god, but literally just knows how to pick things up and put things down. Maybe not even that. He probably does that wrong. James, you ever seen Super Jack guys like do like the incline bench wrong? And you're like, you don't know how to lift weights. Yeah. Like you it's can't baffling. instruct other people to lift weights. You can't pass the USAW level one course. <laughs> like forget the, the lifts, the assistance part. <laughs> so, um, you know, for those folks, remember when you are transmitting fitness to other people you don't do it by giving them your genetics you do it by giving them your knowledge and the way you get knowledge is to learn as much as you can intellectually and try all the stuff yourself go as hard as you can and the more your genetics suck the more you're going to have to figure out the best of best ways there are people that get to 200 pounds drug free knowing dick they make awful fucking trainers awful coaches most of the ifbb do not have other pro bodybuilders as their coaches most of the IFBB have other folks with not so amazing genetics that have figured stuff out. A uh, really quick example, Matt Jansen. He's probably going to be a pro someday because he's got pretty decent genetics. But Matt Jansen is currently coaching like half the IFBB or something like that. Um, uh, and and who, what, uh, you know, is he the biggest bodybuilder? He's not even close, right? He's super jacked, but he's not even close to the biggest guy. Matt Jansen has to earn shit the fucking hard way because he didn't get gifted. He got good genetics, but not amazing. And, and there's tons of other examples and tons of other natty guys and, and, and tons of other people. Eric Helms would be the first person to tell you he does not have amazing genetics. Eric Helms can coach mother, most other guys into a fucking, you know, in, you know into a plastic bag. Like he, he's just going to... Uh, He's just going to be a better coach because he had to try. So uh, if po folks have above average genetics and they're trying to figure out coaching, a lot of times I don't have shit to tell them other than you got to get as big as humanly possible in order to really test the limits of your knowledge and see if you know what you know. But for guys who without great genetics, they make excellent coaches. And from a career perspective, you just do transformation photos and transformation stories. You get some clients because you know your shit. You're not super jacked. And then they get uh, incredible results. I'll bring this up, and this is for geared bodybuilding, but the, the, the principles are even more exaggerated. There's a coach out there. I don't even know what the fuck his real name is. P P T U O R P T U R or something. I don't know what the fuck his real name is, but that's his Instagram handle. Again, he coaches like, I don't even know how many pros, and he always transforms them into these total freaks. Is he jacked? I don't even know what the fuck he looks like. I literally don't even know his name. I don't give a fuck. I don't even think he, I don't know, I don't know who he is. And it doesn't matter because he brings results. Hani Rambod, who coaches Phil Heath. Hani's not jacked. What about the guy Ahmed uh, Asgar in uh, the Kuwait? He mm -hmm. used to be sort of jacked, but isn't anymore. He coaches freaks. Who, you know, it doesn't fucking Chad Nichols. I don't even know if Chad Nichols ever lifted weights. He's coached Ronnie Coleman. And like, it's, it's knowledge. It's knowledge and it's doing things the hard way that's going to get you good. It doesn't matter. Instagram people that have amazing whatevers, you'd be surprised how little money they make from coaching when people figure out they can't do fucking dick. Yeah, those are all really excellent. Um, I had a similar thought process going through and it was it was like on an unrelated note, it was on MMA, but I think you'll you'll get the idea here. I was listening to Michael Bisping's podcast a little while ago and it was right around the time that Alexander Gustafson had lost his most recent fight and said he was going to retire. And the co-host on the show goes, you know, I get the idea that you want to be the best in the world, but why do all you fucking MMA guys retire uh, when you still have plenty of good fights left in you and you still have a totally viable career option? So what? You're not the best in the world. You can still fight and make money and still do a good job, right? Uh, and I thought that was really an interesting point that he made because everyone always talks about being the best. And the same thing kind of goes in this, in this question where he's like, oh, I might not have the greatest genetics. Like, should I, you know, pursue bodybuilding? Sure. Why not? Who cares? Do your, you don't have to be the fucking best. You don't have to be a world champion or Mr. Olympia. Like if it's something that you like and you enjoy, who gives a shit if you have shitty genetics, just do the best that you can do and get as much out of it that you want out of it. Right. And just keep that in mind that there's no, there's no reason not to pursue something just because you can't be the best. If it brings you sat satisfaction and happiness and whatever, just do it. Who gives a you shit? In MMA, people want to see you fight. You got fans. You're gonna you fight for the fans too, and, and for your own soul. Uh, and in in fitness, it's even more uh, helpful because you don't coach to be the best coach. You coach to help every single person you're coaching. People need your help. Hani Rambod, let's say he's the best bodybuilding coach. I don't know if that's true. He's certainly one of them, right? He can't possibly coach everyone. That's fucking impossible. Yeah. So you gotta, everyone's gotta help, you know? Um, it's just not, you know, that, that's how it works. Uh, uh, something from MMA James that comes to my mind is there's guys that like are sort of strategizing to be the best and if they can't, they're done. And they maybe have their reasons, you know, get lowering your IQ for no reason is not good, getting hit in the head all the time. And maybe you wanna move on to different things. But then there's guys, uh, which, you know, equally good merit are guys just like to fight. They don't give a fuck what, like George Masvidal and Nate Diaz. 
these motherfuckers like to bang. They'd probably be fighting in, in prison if they weren't fighting legally. Like, they just like to fight. And, and you arguably, like to coach? Coach way. They're arguably more successful in terms of how much money they make than the, a lot of the world champions. Because you know you want to fight. Those guys, I don't think, it, George Masvidal and Nate Diaz may have never turned down a fight in their lives. Like in any actual capacity. Like some guy at a bar is like, do you want to fight? And they're like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> why not? <laughs> there's a there's a boss rootin tells this story about himself much better than i ever will but uh, james you know the boss rootin uh you want to fight story yes yeah you guys should Excellent. look this up because it's on youtube he, he goes through this on youtube on video but like that was uh, with brian urlacher wasn't it brian urlacher yeah yeah like yeah. he didn't know who he was and brian urlacher like uh bumped into him by accident at a like some kind of soiree kind of party and he like uh, spilled the uh, boss rootin spilled his beer at brian urlacher and brian urlacher's like what the fuck man and he's like hey let me buy you a beer sorry about that and yeah yeah boss rootin was trying to boss rootin by the way is one of the legends of mma and Brian Urlacher was like, nah, man, like, it's not going to work. Like, do you want to take this outside? And Bob Struden's like, okay. And Brian Urlacher was like, who the fuck answers a question like that? And Brian's like football buddies pulled him aside. And they're like, you fucking know who that is? This guy no, will end you, your football career. You want and then Brian Urlacher came up later and he was like, hey, it's all big Mr. Standing Let me buy you a beer. And then they were super <laughs> best friends after that. <laughs> I love that. Like, do you want to take this shit. outside? Like, yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> like, I will fucking uh, kill you. I am allowing you to live right now. Yeah. Every okay. moment you breathe is for me. Mike, before we go, pull up your share exactly as it was when you were doing the YouTube comments. Oh, there, were, there was something that was distracting me severely. Okay. Natty yeah. or not. Look at that fucking video on the right. Like when we were talking, I just couldn't stop looking at it. I was like, what is this? What is it? Is Gymshark athlete David Lay natural by <laughs> Greg Doucette? I have a lot of respect for Greg Doucette. I think he's great. But these Natty or not videos are just... <laughs> I, like, I have a different submission. Who gives a shit? Right. Mike is retired. <laughs> so funny. Sorry. When we were reading that, I kept like, my eyes kept glancing over to the natty. On that whole yeah. Time. It's all about figuring out who's on drugs. So you can sit at home and be like, Oh, I know it. I knew it. I knew it. Ah. I didn't even know it. I'm just still hypothesizing, but oh, oh fuck that oh. guy. Exactly. All right. On, on that note, I think we'll wrap up this one for this week, guys. Uh, thanks again. We were a little off schedule this week, so appreciate your patience. We'll get this one on YouTube and, Hopefully, uh, I think we're on schedule normal for next week, yeah? Yeah. Okay, so we'll be at normal time. This week we were off schedule. We'll be back on our normal schedule of Tuesdays at uh, 4.30 Pacific Standard Time and 7.30 Eastern U.S. Time. So we'll see you next time. Boom. Folks, see you next time.